I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, something I did last week, and that was I got um, I got onto a four-day defensive handgun training at the Front Sight uh, Firearms Training Institute in, at their facility in Nevada. It's about an hour's drive from Las Vegas. Um, I had heard about Frontside before, and a friend of mine actually specifically recommended that I get out there and get that training. And uh, getting some firearms training uh, has been on my mind for a while. Um, I got into, I first got into firearms a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, uh, I got my first handgun. And I wouldn't even touch it before I got my first one-day training, about basic pistol training, before I could trust myself to safely manipulate a weapon. Um, I did not load. I, I did not load or again manipulate my, uh, the uh, firearm in any way. Or rather, I would not touch the live ammunition um, and have anything to do with a loaded gun before I uh, got that first training. But that was really it. Then I was able to find a club that was still accepting new members here in New Jersey. It's actually exceedingly difficult to do, uh, to find a place to shoot regularly. And I was able to do that. Uh, it's a bit of a, you know, bit of a drive. It's about, you know, 20 something miles from my house. But I try to do it at least once a, a week. Um, go there and uh, spend an hour, an hour and a half shooting. Partly because it's fun, and uh, more importantly because I think, you know, I got uh, myself a weapon, in several sense, for philosophical reasons. I believe it's very important to um, have the capability to protect yourself should, you know, the, the unthinkable happen. Not that I'm planning on, on you know, having it happen to me, but, uh, you know, you never know. And it's better to have some options than no options, and it's better to have more options than, than, than fewer. So, and since, you know, I, I, you know, I decided, you know, if I'm going to have a weapon, I need to know what to do with it. So at least I was going out and shooting. But what I was doing was just, you know, slow fire, target shooting, shooting groups. And I wasn't very good at it either. Um, and I, I realized that I wasn't getting better. And also, I didn't quite know why I wasn't getting better. The shooting is very interesting because it's, uh, it's actually highly unnatural. <laughs> Pretty much everything you do in manipulating a, 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 a handgun, at least, you know, I think rifle may be different, but you know, I'm not very big on rifle yet. I'm, I'm building my my carbine, uh, and once it's done, I'll start practicing with a long gun, uh, with, you know, uh, an AR-15 carbine regularly. Uh, and the good thing is that the, the the club that I'm a member at, they have an outdoor range. They only have distances up to uh, you know up to a hundred yards, but that's something. Um, so I, I, I will be able to go out there and uh, practice with my with my carbine. But anyway, with a handgun, most of the things that you're doing are highly unnatural, <laughs> and uh, therefore, um, unless you know why you're failing at shooting accurately and or fast, um, you will not you will not improve with practice. That's the thing about it. You you know you can practice all you want. And you may not even get better. And I see a lot of people at the range. But when I I try to come in there where, when uh, uh, it's likely that there's not going to be a lot of people at the range, and I have the range all to myself. It's sort of a it's a very nice facility. Well, it's, it's a very simple facility, but it's nice because it's 24 seven, and uh, members have key cards, and I can come in and, and open it up, and you know turn on the lights, turn on the ventilation, have the range to myself, shoot, clean up, uh, shut off the lights, and leave. Basically, in the middle of the night. Um, and I actually go quite late in, in the evening uh, uh, on a weeknight. Um, and the most that I, you know, I've seen were a couple of people uh, at the same time there as, as myself. But the people that I do see, they are... I haven't seen anybody like taking notes while they're shooting or analyze their groups or anything. And this one guy that I you know, uh, started a conversation with he was missing, and I had, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. I had, I had read a book, a wonderful little book about pistol shooting, and I just shared a couple of pointers that I took away from myself from the book. And immediately, you know, I, I, you know, 
I I just you, by using those couple of pointers, I was able to hit his target, and he was amazed because like, how do you do that? I you know I keep I keep missing. I just, you know I'm I'm hitting by accident pretty much. But anyway, so so the point uh, for me was I didn't quite know why I wasn't getting better, and therefore since I don't know what exactly I'm doing wrong, I can't really improve with practice. All I'm doing is I'm learning. I'm getting better at shooting poorly, right? And I uh, I had read Boston Tea Party's uh, Boston's Gun Bible, uh, which is a wonderful book. Uh, if you you know it's any, everything you ever wanted to learn about firearms and more. And when I when I say about firearms, meaning you know, I mean you know, in the practical sense, what firearms to own, uh, what firearms not to own, how to use them, what's good about them, what's bad about them, how to compare them. Uh, you know what kind of firearms you should own, depending on where you live, depending on your circumstances and whatnot. It's a it's a huge book. It's this thick. You know, granted, they they you know they use uh, heavy stock paper on that book, but it's a big book. All right, uh, it's actually absolutely worth every penny that they charge for it on Amazon. I think it's twenty something dollars. Uh, I actually need to reread it now, now that I've done my training. So he keeps saying in the book, go out and get training while it's still legal. And ever since I read that book, I, I you know, uh, it was sort of somewhere at the back of my mind all the time. I need to get some training. I need to, I need to get serious about this. And finally, um, a friend of mine uh, mentioned it in a conversation, and I, I started looking uh, into it a little closer. And long story short, I was able to get uh, fairly inexpensively get into a, tra- a four-day training course uh, at the front site um, in uh, Pahrump, Nevada. Mind you, uh, if you're going to look into that, if especially if you live in that area, if you live in Utah, Nevada, Arizona, perhaps maybe Southern California, where it's a driving distance, you know, or close to being a driving distance to Vegas or thereabouts, uh, it's absolutely worth it. But if you go to uh, Frontside's website, the list price for that course is 2K. Don't pay the list price. All you need to do is go on eBay and search for Frontside certificate. People are selling. Like gifts, well, not gift certificates, but access certificates, pretty much like vouchers to those training courses. I got mine for I think for fifty bucks. So instead of two thousand dollars, I paid fifty dollars um, to attend that course. Now, my expenses, you know, the flight, the hotel, the rental car, the gas, the ammo, um, the rental kit. Uh, I rented a gun and a holster and uh, a couple magazine pouches and a belt um, at the at the training. Because I decided against flying with my own weapon, because flying with a gun, even when it's properly, you know, locked up in a case and stuff, flying out of a New Jersey airport with a gun, even though you're totally legal, is a crapshoot. You may end up, well, if not arrested, then at least harassed or, or, uh, you know, delayed or whatever. I didn't want to play that game. I decided, look, uh, well, there was another option for me to take. I could have driven to Pennsylvania. There's a, an airport in Allentown uh, in Pennsylvania, which is a couple of hours. I could have driven there and, uh, you know, could have flown out with my own gun. But I looked at it and I realized, you know, if I leave the car there for five days, I'm going to have to pay parking. And the parking and the gas together sort of amounts to pretty much, you know, the, 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 uh, the sum of money that they charge for the rental kit. So I decided to avoid the hassle and the extra driving because I live like 20 minutes away from uh, the airport um, uh, here in New Jersey. And I decided, what the hell, it's the same money. I'll just rent a package uh, from them directly, which was what I did. But, uh, you know, the, the, the gun that I rented, Glock 22, is almost identical, uh, slightly larger than the gun that I own, Glock 23. So I thought, you know, it's, it's going to be a worthwhile. Uh, I mean, the training is going to be actually useful because it's, it's almost the same model of the gun. Anyway, here's my impressions about the actual training. Oh, I, I was going to say, you know, how much it cost me. It cost me, I think, it cost me in excess of eight, uh, fifteen hundred dollars, uh, all things put together. Uh, but it was worth every penny. It was worth every single penny. So to sum up my impressions, uh, well, first of all, let me let me tell you what they did. What we actually did during the training, how they trained us. Um, the uh, participants were split up into groups of you know twenty twenty plus, you know, twenty twenty two people. Um, we had an instructor, a head instructor, who was sort of leading the class, and he would get assistants to come in and, and do uh, portions of the instruction. Uh, they would also assist him at the range because you have to watch 
safety safety is actually very well uh, emphasized uh, over there, and they they keep a very close eye on how safely people are manipulating their weapons. And uh, in four days, in four days, there was one discharge of a weapon out of a group of 22 or 23 people or something like that. Uh, in in four days, there was one time where we were practicing malfunction drills, malfunction clearing drills, and you do that with you know, realistically loaded weapons, and uh, at the end of a drill, what you're supposed to do is you clear a malfunction, you strip a magazine out of your gun, you, you insert a, a spare, a loaded magazine, the gun goes into battery, you point back into the target and put the finger on the trigger, and somebody put the finger on the trigger a little bit too far, and the gun went off, but the gun was pointed at the target at the time, downrange, and nobody was, nobody was in, in any danger. Um, they just laughed about it, and that was it. Um, they really watch, uh, you know, very closely how safely you're doing what you're doing. So about half half a day, first half of the first day was basically they put you in, in you know, they pair, uh, pair you up with another participant and you take turns coaching and practicing and you're watching and they, they, they you know, the first instruction you get is how to stop dangerous things from happening. Let's say somebody somebody has a, a gun in their hand and they, uh, they're face down range but they forget where they are and they start turning around with their gun in their head and start, you know, sort of coming close to sweeping this arc and, you know, uh, coming close to breaking the, the 180, the one, 180 degrees, how to stop them, you know, you, you've, you're supposed to physically put your hands on their arm and stop them from turning their gun in a dangerous direction. If, you know, you, you, you're trying to watch with a trigger finger, um, you know, if, if the person uh, is not supposed to have their trigger finger inside the trigger guard, you're supposed to tell them. Um, and tell them forcefully, and it was actually very, very good. It was very sobering and very good. And then they start, you know, to teach you the actual basics of defensive defensive handgunnery. Um, now, my number one impression was, oh my god, I've wasted so much time and ammo just practicing slow fire, just, just shooting at the targets uh, at my range, uh, because it has nothing to do. The slow fire has nothing to do with the real world potential defensive situation where you are either uh, well you, you're basically carrying a weapon either concealed or openly most likely concealed and there's a situation where you decide that you have to uh, draw your weapon and in most cases uh, the the whole engagement is, is very likely to be very very short and therefore you have to be pretty quick about you know doing what you're, what you're planning to do, but also uh, one interesting thing that never occurred to me again because you know, I'm slow and you know I never really you know I never really exposed myself to any serious information about defensive use of handguns. Uh, but basically, what they're teaching you to do is your your objective is to to stop a threat. If and I'm not going to go into how you determine what you know where the line in the sand is and how your thinking goes about uh, what threats are, you know, ha you know what threats are, I'm allowing to escalate, or rather, uh, where the where where the trigger is, where the the line in the sand is, after which you will absolutely use your weapon, either you know brandish it and threaten to use it, or directly just use it. I'm not going to go into that. They do give you instruction. There's lectures there as well. It's not just practical, uh, you know, range time. Um, but that's a whole other story. Uh, let me just say that uh, the course itself, by the way, the course itself is not supposed to be like at the end of the course. You're not supposed to be the master of uh, you know defensive handgun. What it is is not an end. It's a beginning. Uh, it's supposed to. At least that was my takeaway. I think now that at least I know. I don't know how to use a handgun yet, but I know how to train how to use a handgun. I know about learning how to use a handgun much more anyway than I did before I went there. And uh, my entire thing, my, my entire training at the range is going to change. I never did any dry practice to speak of uh, uh, at home. I will do that now. I am doing it now because it's the cheapest and most effective way to get better at very certain, you know, very specific things like, you know, your, your presentation techniques or your draw your trigger control, uh, sight alignment, sight picture, things like that, uh, you can actually get a lot of mileage out of dry practice. Just dry practice with an unloaded gun at home. And uh, I actually bought the manual. They, 
you know, I like the you know their the business model. I, I you, you sort of expect like you know they give this instruction, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna remember several hours of lectures. I'm not gonna you know most of the, you know, some of the things that they did uh, that they gave us some of the some of the advice I did remember it sort of got a little bit ingrained in the four days because you keep hearing it and you spend a solid nine hours a day easy at the range. Um, you know all things all things put together, um, it's actually pretty. Now, for some people, it may be pretty taxing physically, especially considering that uh, we were doing it in a 100 degree heat, uh, almost zero humidity in, in, in the desert. I thought it was fun, but I could see you know how people were struggling, and I, you know it wasn't it wasn't 100 comfortable. <laughs> put it that way, uh, not all the time anyway. So you're supposed to stay hydrated, and you're supposed to use like a ton of sunblock and all that. Um, but uh, anyway, so I wasn't going to remember everything, and I decided, what the hell, I you know, shelled out the, the money that they charge for a little photocopied, basically photocopied and, and bound together booklet, uh, the dry practice instruction. But I think it's absolutely worth it, otherwise obviously I wouldn't have bought it, um, to guide me through my, my dry practice at home. But here's one thing, you know, to show you this is the practical approach. Uh, the, uh, the way to st stop an opponent stop an adversary uh, is you're not you're not shooting to kill them but you're shooting to stop them uh, if they're charging at you with a weapon or at, at somebody else with a weapon or something if, if you perceive a mortal threat to yourself or other innocents um, that's when you use your weapon to stop the person and the most effective way to quickly stop them is to put shots uh, into their thoracic cavities right here where most of our vital organs are concentrated arteries vein you know, arteries arteries lungs heart Lots of important stuff. So if you're going to shoot, shoot center mass. Um, medically speaking, that's called the thoracic cavity. And they teach you to put what they call controlled pairs into the thoracic cavity. Uh, two shots in uh, quick succession. It's not a double tap. There is no such thing as double tap. But uh, you're trained to put two aim shots quickly into the center of the thoracic cavity. Now, what they say is... The aim is not to put them through, through the two shots through the same hole. You might think that that's ideal, that's like 100% accuracy. It's not even ideal. Here's why. Uh, we're talking about a combination of both accuracy and speed. Uh, every tenth of a second you, let, you, you use less to uh, place your two shots is the one tenth of a second less that they have to move towards you or do something nasty. So they say, look, you want you want your shots to land in the thoracic cavity. Now, uh, we want you guys. They said that we want you guys to group your shots so that you can cover the holes in the target with a hand like this. Here's why: uh, under stress in real life situation, your accuracy is going to deteriorate, and your shots are going to be grouped at least you know twice as badly. Right? Right? right what's the right way to say it? Anyway. Your, your, your shots are going to be at least 50% less tight than in practice, okay? And you'll notice if you place shots, if you place your shots in the center of the thoracic cavity and your groups are about this large, you know, they're so large that you can cover them with a hand like that, even if they spread out, you know, uh, to cover twice the area, they're still in the thoracic cavity. So you're still... In, in good shape in that you're probably going to inflict some damage and, and stop the threat. If your groups are smaller than that, that means that you're not shooting quickly enough. And again, you're giving your adversary time to close the distance between you or to do something. So if your groups are smaller, you need to speed up. If your groups are larger, you need to slow down. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I never thought about it. So, you know, deliberate slow fire is one thing, and it's actually help, you know, it's very, very helpful learning the fundamentals of marksmanship, specifically the trigger control, because uh, that's something I, try, I struggle with. Um, it may be a function of the weapon you're using. I mean, some weapons are better than others. Some, some, some triggers are better than others. I had actually just swapped out a trigger, uh, um, trigger bar, a trigger in the trigger bar in my Glock 23. I have a Generation 4, and I swapped out... Uh, the trigger for the previous generation's trigger and it's slightly less gritty and it's slightly less crisp but the Glock trigger especially on the generation 4 is so crisp that I think it's a little too heavy for me so I swapped it out I think I like the feel better I'm able to achieve that surprise break um, better I think 
I think. So, but I need to train more, especially because I hadn't actually gone to the range with my gun after uh, since coming back from the training. So my whole idea of how the gun is actually used, uh, to be honest, I didn't really have uh, you know much of an idea, but it does ground you very very well that that practice. And um, let me tell you a little bit about the crowd there. Uh, like I said, the group was about twenty something people, and about one third of them were women, and about one half of the women were actually retiree age women. Uh, there were lots of married couples. Some of them again retirement age or close to. There were single grandmothers, uh, including like this frail-looking five-four or five-five uh, tall grandmother who looked like she was gonna. And it looked like she she could she could pass out any minute. She was rocking her Glock like like nobody's business. She was putting those rounds through those papers and uh, through those targets like nobody's business. It was very very fun to watch. Uh, younger people. Like uh, you know, again, young married couples. There was a couple there from from uh, Missouri that I, I I hope to be able to stay in contact with them because the guy was really you know, was interested. We we had some political conversations there, and a lot of those people are actually a, a, you know a lot into like Second Amendment and gun rights, which is to be expected, I guess. Um, but anyway, the younger younger married couple, six kids at home. You know, you know, husband and wife and father-in-law together came together to train. Um, retired couples, retired single men who live in a remote area, decided to get a gun, realized they don't know how to use it, you know, looked it up, found the training, came to, to get the training. The instructor was very politically correct. They never spoke anything. They never, like, you know, in their both formal and informal talks or during practical instruction at the range they never really veered at all into like the politics of gun rights or anything like that they you know a couple of times the chief instructor I liked the guy uh, quite a bit you know, he's uh, like 56 or 58 even though he used to work as a prison guard um, but he's a very very good instructor um, very considerate very knowledgeable and uh, very helpful. It's not like a boot camp or anything. It's uh, they are actually very appreciative of your patronage because you're the customer, and uh, they, you know, I, I I thought that the quality of instruction that I received was actually pretty good. There, there was, you know, some instructors are better than others. Some some are a little bit obnoxious, some of them were less. But overall, I was very pleased. So the guy, the chief instructor there, he sort of veered into that area a little bit. For example, he would say. We do not say high capacity magazines. It's the adversary's language. We say standard capacity magazines and reduced capacity magazines, which I thought was was funny. Um, but anyway, so we were taught to do things like so essentially uh, technique wise, they teach you to quickly present your weapon and quickly put uh, a controlled pair of shots into the center of thoracic cavity of your adversary. If you fail to stop your, the threat with those shots, which is a possibility if they're wearing body armor, if they're on drugs, or if you miss, you're supposed to take a controlled, very deliberate shot to the head. Not just to the head, but this area here. I think they refer to it as cranial ocular cavity. Basically, where you have the highest chances of hitting the brain and, and really stopping the threat. Um, and it sounds kind of graphic, and it is, but that's what it is the you know that's what the weapon is for you it's it's a lethal weapon it's if it's going to be used it's going to be used against a live human being to stop that human being and if putting a bullet through their brain is what it takes then you know if it's worth doing then that's what you're gonna have to do and in order to be able to do it you need to train you need to know and practice so basically that was really it uh, we would practice at a, at, a, at a variety of distances from 3 yards to 5 to 7, 10, and even 15 yards. Um, then they did some clever things to induce stress. Let's say they did what was called a you know man-on-man. -man. It's like really a, like a simulated gunfight. It's not like people firing at each other, of course not. But uh, two identical uh, stages were set with three steel targets. One um, was actually a hostage situation where you have a black you know a steel target painted black and that's the hostage and they would fresh spray paint uh, the uh, the targets after each 
shooter be, uh, in order to see the marks where the bullets make the marks on the steel because uh, you know behind the head of the hostage there's a, a, a steel plate that's painted different color the hostage is really black and the plate is white and it swivels and if you hit it it's going to flip to the other side so you're supposed to your first shot is supposed to go to that small plate and it's an opening maybe four by four inches and you're shooting from a distance of uh, I don't know, five seven yards which doesn't sound like a lot but under stress and under time because your opponent uh, right here next to you they're sh they're under the same clock and you, you 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 know you get started by the same signal whoever completes the 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 stage first wins and it's an elimination race um, so there's quite a bit of stress going on, quite a bit of adrenaline pumping through your veins there, let me tell you. Um, so you're supposed to go to the hostage taker first, then there's an outside target about 15 yards, or maybe a little more, torso size, steel target, if you hit, you know, bullet hits it, it drops in its stand a little bit, so it's clearly visible, uh, and then there's another target right in front of you, and whoever completes the, the stage first uh, wins, if you hit the hostage, uh, the hostage dies, you lose. If both com uh, contestants hit their hostages, they both lose. They, they're both eliminated. And the funny thing was, the uh, you know this elimination thing kept going. I, I went through the first stage. I was able to hit the hostage taker and take those other two targets uh, down. And then the next time, I hit the hostage here in the shoulder. <laughs> um, I was positive I, I, you know, I had it. I was positive I... And the thing flipped because the hostage uh, steel plate hit the, uh, the, the the swivel plate and the, the, um, the plate flipped. So it appeared to me as though I had actually successfully hit the hostage taker. And then I saw the mark later when I completed the the, uh, the stage. I saw the mark on the <laughs> on the target's shoulder there. Anyway, so the the, the two finalists, uh, the two finalists, their adrenaline got so high that and they were going so smooth you know three shots three hits all it took for them they kept firing at that hostage take I think they took five or six shots and they both hit their hostages in the finals and they both lost and nobody won the prize that was fun cigar went out so anyway um, they did try to put quite a bit of stress into the situation as much as possible and then at the end there was a test and I fell apart at the test. I, I didn't do very well. I don't even know my score. To be honest, I, I forgot or didn't care to ask. How I scored. And they have you present a weapon from concealment, from an open open front garment. Like I had a shirt, uh, I had a t-shirt tucked into my jeans and a shirt open at the front over it. And you're supposed to go inside your shirt, present your weapon, and fire two shots into the into the target. And sometimes they will yell head and you're supposed to take a delivered shot to the you know head portion of the target. And they score your hits and misses and they score the time and every time you, you you're actually under time. Uh, so for example I think it's one point eight seconds that you're supposed to take to fire two shots into the center uh, mass of a target uh, from about five or seven yards. Which if you think about it, you know, it's uh, I think two seconds is the is the time that it takes an average man to cover the distance of seven yards. If somebody is charging you, you better be able to do it. So it's entirely practical. But by the end of the fourth day, which was when the test was taken, I, you know, I was so tired I fell apart. Another thing they do is they have a target. It's a silhouette, and uh, they're so the head of the silhouette. There's there's a head. Uh, behind it, partially hidden by it, and there's another head behind it too. And those are the bad guys, and you can see half the head area of each of the two bad guys, right? So it's, the head area of the target is about three by five inches. So take half of that, so you know, three, roughly three by three inches, and you're standing at five yards or something, or seven yards, and they ask you for a name of a family member that you love very deeply. And then they write that name on the target, on the hostage. So you're supposed to miss a hostage but hit the bad guy. That was nerve-wracking, you know, to look at that, that target and see my son's name written across it. And I knew it was a piece of paper, but still, it still induced some kind of stress. I was, I, by the way, I, you know, I, I, I took him out. Uh, I took the bad guys out. Uh, you're supposed to fire five shots into each head. And my groups are very, very nice and tight. I actually have the target at home. So my son is alive. The bad guys are down. 
Um, anyway, I, I fired in excess of 600 shots in four days. That's how much ammo it takes. Am I a better shot now? Yes, a little bit. But what I'm better at now, most of all, is the understanding of how to train. That's really what you take away. It's not like you've mastered a defensive handgun. Now. No, I haven't. Of course I haven't. In fact, they have advanced courses, and the, 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 the way it's set up is if you score over a certain percentage at, at your test, only then you're eligible for their other test, which is smart because a lot of people actually keep coming back. Uh, I don't see myself coming back very soon or very often because it's just a heck of an expense to fly over there. If this was on the East Coast, somewhere I could drive to, no problem. I would be there every weekend. Well, not every weekend, but every month, okay, because it's that useful. I can see a lot of value in doing something like that again. In fact, I've looked around for like East, East, East Coast-based courses, and I'm going to make sure that my wife attends one of them. Um, I think I found one in August in Pennsylvania that uh, has pretty good reviews online. I want her to attend it. Um, but yeah, uh, bottom line, if you own a gun, or even if you don't, but you're, you, if you're thinking about getting a gun, for either home defense or carrying or both you absolutely need to get training be it a four day or one day or two day I think I think one day is definitely not enough I think it has to be at least two days or more to get into the mindset and the techniques to begin to understand what you need to do to get better at using your your handgun for self-defense but you absolutely need it I don't think uh, that you'll be very effective with your weapon if you don't if you haven't properly trained it is possible that you could you know uh, get incrementally get instruction incrementally but I think uh, you know an immersion immersion type training for a couple of days or more is quite effective it sort of uh, sets, sets your head straight in terms of what you need to do so my wholehearted recommendation is that you find something like that and attend it front sight is not bad Again, if you live in that area of the country, absolutely consider it. And do not pay the list price. Go on eBay and find a certificate. Um, if you don't live close, you know, you, you got to figure out what, what cost would be acceptable to you. Uh, but absolutely consider it. Um, do not think that just because you go to a range every, every once in a, you know, again um, and you, 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 you know, shoot at some paper targets that you know what you're doing. I absolutely don't know what I'm doing yet. I'm at least I'm beginning to see a way to get to a place where I will sort of begin to know what I'm doing with, with a handgun. Plus it's a lot of fun. Wouldn't you want to be able to, you know, draw your weapon from concealment and place two aim shots uh capable of stopping an opponent in under two seconds from a distance of seven yards, which is the mean distance for all firefights, for most firefights? I think uh, you know. Apart from apart from you know it you know sounding cool, which I guess it does, it's it's what you want to be able to do. You know, if you can't do that, you're actually not safe just because you're carrying a gun. Um, so uh, and there also another important portion of it was the malfunction clearing drills. Like guns will malfunction. Guns are mechanical devices; they will fail. When they do, you need to know what to do. If you're in the middle of a firefight, God forbid. Uh, and your your gun fails to fire or fails to eject or whatever, you need to know what to do exactly. And some of those malfunction clearing uh, manipulations may be pretty involved. And unless you have training, you're not you're just gonna stand there and be a target. Um, you will not be able to get out of there. Um, so those things absolutely require that you train and you train and you train and you train until you get it down to muscle memory. Okay, so that's that. Get gun training. Spend the money. Spend the time. It's absolutely worth it. If you believe in defending yourself with a firearm, you absolutely need to do it. All right. Uh, again, if you have any specific questions, feel free to send me a personal message. I'll be happy to share what I know. Um, that's it.